Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1990 film Tremors. Yes, the original Tremors, which let me point out that the Graboids don't look like this. That's always been a weird thing to me that on the cover art, it has these gigantic teeth and you don't see those gigantic teeth. Where's the beak? Where's the beak? It's always been weird to me. But anyway, watch Tremors. Uh, when I'm posting this review, it's available for streaming on Netflix. That's where I found it. Not only that, but they have all the Tremors movies on Netflix. And I will say that I had my wife watch this film with me and she actually enjoyed it, which isn't a big surprise. It's a PG-13 horror film. It's a creature feature and there's a lot of comedy to it. So it's, you know, easily accessible to a lot of people, not just the horror community. So since she's down with it, she's down to watch number two and we'll see how far we go. Now, rest assured that if we watch all of them or if we just watch a few of them, I will be doing reviews for them and putting them up here and we'll see how that goes. But let's talk about Tremors, the original. This was directed by a Ron Underwood who directed such movies as City Slickers, Mighty Joe Young, The Adventures of Pluto Nash, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of TV episodes of shows. So just so you know where he is. Uh, it was The script was partially written, a little bit of input from Underwood on the script, but mainly written by S.S. S. Wilson and Brent Maddock, uh, who wrote together the scripts for Short Circuit, Short Circuit 2, Batteries Not Included, uh, the Tremors TV show, yes, there was a Tremors TV show, I believe in 2003, and uh, all of the Tremors sequels. Now, this is a rare instance where the writers for the original film had been involved with then five sequels and a TV show. That's crazy. They were the writers for this. So that gives me hope for checking out more, to be honest. And um, I had seen the original Tremors before, but I've actually never gone past that. So I'm excited to actually move past and experience more Tremors action, if you will. The budget for this film was $11 million, and it ended up made, making $16 million in the box office. So not like a gigantic return on it, but hey, it made $5 million. That's not bad for a horror film, in my opinion. Um, Maddock and Wilson were actually filmmakers in the Navy. This is their background, the writers. They were actually filmmakers in the Navy making, of all things, safety videos for the Navy, which I think is a really funny thing. Uh, they created a concept of land sharks and talked to Ron Underwood about it, who at the time had been a National Geographic's uh, filmmaker. He literally worked for National Geographic making films. So he had a lot of information about creatures. So he actually sat down with them and helped them uh, further develop the, the whole land shark concept. And instead of using actual sharks on land, creating a creature that kind of felt like it could be realistic and maybe it could actually exist one day under underground so um i thought that was a really cool thing it was originally called land sharks and then they changed it and obviously it's become tremors although the th some people refer to the creatures as tremors they are not tremors they are referred to as graboids so just know that uh the elephant gun that ends up being used in this by bert uh, played by michael gross was actually uh borrowed from a collector a gun collector and they actually had to manufacture like make custom uh dummy bullets for the gun for the film which is really interesting and that's not, kind of an iconic part because when he grabs this gigantic gun you're just like oh my gosh here we go and then you also see the gigantic size of those friggin' bullets it's it's unbelievable um the original score was by an Ernest Troost but it was actually mainly music that sounded kind of goofy, apparently. So they decided to get rid of a lot of that music. They edited it out and instead brought in a Robert Folk, who then created a score that was more kind of action, uh, action based, action and adventure based, which I think works well for this film, in my opinion. The film originally got an R rating from the MPAA because of using the F word a lot. So the studio actually wanted to make it a PG-13 to make it more accessible to families and other people who aren't, you know, necessarily looking for an R-rated film. And so they cut a lot of the F-words out, and in other areas they actually dubbed over them. So you, if you really pay attention, you can kind of see it a few of the times where they dubbed over that. 
The concept of the Graboids are to be like sharks of the land, as sharks are ancient creatures of the ocean. That's the whole concept of this. When they came up with the whole land sharks thing, they didn't actually end up going with actual sharks, but they wanted something like sharks in the ocean. Since sharks are these ancient predators in the ocean, they wanted to create the ancient predators on the land. So Graboids basically are sharks. Now, what, where did a lot of their inspiration come from? The actual look of it came a lot from the cuttlefish. If you've never seen what a cuttlefish looks like, look it up on Google Images. It's a very interesting looking critter. And when you look at it, you can then see a lot of that in the graboids. Uh, mainly the body shape is the big thing and the mouth has a lot to do with it as well. Um, the joking around and bickering between Earl and Valentine in this film sets a very interesting fun tone early on. Not only does it set a fun tone, it lets you know it's going to be comedy based. Also, it does a good job of kind of just establishing Earl and Val's uh, relationship and how they like to kind of, you know, poke and prod each other and joke around and they don't take things too seriously. The other thing is with a lot of what goes on between them, but pretty much everyone in the film, the dialogue is really well written. And I think that's where a lot of the fun in the film comes from, is just experiencing these people interacting with each other and how the dialogue, like, it feels natural and it feels fun and it feels like these characters legitimately are saying these things. So, I dig it. There's a good dynamic between Val and Earl in the sense that uh, it's, they're polar opposites. They're two different sides of the spectrum. You know, Earl is the older, more experienced guy. Val is the younger, more, less, uh, less likely to think, you know, Earl kind of ribs him all the time for, you know, not really thinking things through. He talks about talk, you know, thinking with his pecker at one point. So, you know, it's this kind of interesting dynamic of, you know, the older guy who's just like, you know, be more grown up, be smarter like me. And then the younger guy who's just like, ah, we don't really need plans. We can just fly by the seat of our pants. Just let's do it. But then they, you know, get on each other's cases all the time about the fact that they never have a plan. And they're always talking about formulating some, side, some sort of plan. They're going to get out of there. They're going to be successful, whatever. And that's an ongoing joke throughout the film, which works. And especially works when, in the end, finally, finally, there's a plan that's formulated by Val that ends up killing the final Graboid. And it, that's the first time that Val has a legitimate plan that works out because there's been all these times where we're like, I got a plan for this, I got a plan for that. And all these plans just don't work. Finally, at the end, a plan that works, which is great. Um, they create the feeling of a very remote, small, simple town. Uh, this way, when the Graboids end up showing up, you know you're getting you know getting help is actually not much of an option in this. They're all trapped and have to take care of it themselves. They do a really good job of kind of making you feel like it's very remote, making you feel like it's very small, like it's very cut off. But then also when the Graboids start really attacking, they tell you things and show you things that indicate to you that it's going to be hard for them to get anywhere. And even when they start to try and use the radio, they're having problems with that. Um, and they talk, like the characters talk to each other about how, you know, well, we could do this, we could try and get away this way or this way, and they're just like, there's just no way. It's until eventually they come to the realization that they have to fight. They have to kill these things. There is no other option. They can't run from it, which is a great thing in this film because it ups the stakes so much. It makes it more tense because you're like, they can't get away. Like, they have to deal with this. They have to overcome it. And how do they do that? That's one of the big questions. Um, I love the couches that Val and Earl have. This is just a little, a very small thing, but I love the fact that they, the couches they have outside that they hang out on and they have the, the beers in the old toilet that they're using as a cooler. That's just a fun, fun little addition to the film that's funny. The gradual clues for the Graboids, Graboids existing are very well paced in the beginning of the film. Uh, the seismic activity, the sand moving, the old drunk on the electrical tower is an indicator of something going on. The farmer eventually getting sucked down into the into the soil. They, they don't show you the Graboid earlier on. They're just giving you these small indicators that it's there. And they do it at such a nice pace that... It just keeps deepening the mystery and keeps you guessing, like, what is going on here? It keeps the tension up, which I like. 
Then the gradual realizations about the behavior of the graboids and how they operate is also well paced and interesting, in my opinion. You can see it leading to an eventual solution, but they just don't have enough information at that point. They spend a lot of time learning about the creatures as they're trying to stay away from them initially, and then later as they're trying to fight them. Uh, I, I just love how it's this learning experience. And I also love how early on it, uh, all the townsfolk are looking to uh, Rhonda, the scientist, and being like, well, you tell us about this creature. You're a scientist. And she's like, I don't know. We just, we all just discovered this creature. I have no idea about it. And they're like, yeah, but you're a scientist. So tell us something about it. I think that's a kind of funny ongoing joke. Uh, and then past that, you know, she's learning about these creatures, but the townsfolk are learning about these creatures as well. And they're all pitching in to glean things about the creature, but to also uh, throw out the stimuli and do the things to uh, get the creature to react, to then figure out, okay, this is how it behaves. Okay, this is what we can do to get it away from us. This is what we can do to actually try and kill it. Uh, it's a really cool trial and error that continually goes on through the movie. And it's good. It, it plays out very well, in my opinion. The graboid piece hanging off of the truck is a great reveal when Earl and Val... Like, there's the first actual piece of a graboid you end up seeing where it kind of grabbed around the axle, uh, and then they drag it into town. That's a really cool um, visual when it when it's your first portion of the graboid being seen. But the little extra addition of that kind of slimy saliva substance on it is that little extra grossness that makes you like, oh, this thing's nasty. When we see this, this thing's going to be kind of nasty, which it you know it is when you eventually see it. People getting pulled underground is actually pretty intense, the way they shoot it. Uh, not only just the getting sucked down, but, you know, the, the violent kind of jerking and movements that the people have and the noises that they include with that. It seems um, violent and, and very um, frantic, but at the same time, it's not gory. And the wonderful thing is it doesn't have to be in this instance. And you can get that PG-13 because all the carnage is happening underground. And people believe that. You know, it's not a situation where, you know, someone gets chomped in half and they're just like, where's all the blood? Well, it happened underground. There's an easy explanation for that. So people don't necessarily need the R rating in this instance. So, yeah. Um, the scenery in this is gorgeous. That's one thing that you become very, very cognizant of very early on it's a beautiful thing which is a, awesome in drawing this kind of stark contrast between the beauty around everyone and what nature looks like there versus what is happening the actual events of these people having to fight off this well a bunch of these terrible creatures that are trying to eat them ancient creatures the reveal of the full-on graboid is really good in my opinion it looks ugly and it looks terrifying in person uh and the the sheer size the scale that they make of it is a wonderful thing i also love the part where they had it pull that entire car that station wagon down into the ground it's a really good showing early on of the strength and ability of these things and it also gives you an indication of probably what the size is going to be when you eventually see one and yeah it makes sense when you do uh, when you go into the whole biology of the creature, it actually seems legitimate. Like when they're actually talking about, oh, it's like this, it looks like this, it does this. And, you know, we can, you know, the fact that it can't see and, you know, it, it does things, uh, based off vibration to figure out where things are. Like it all seems legitimate. Like it's believable the way they play it out. There aren't any of these things that come up with the biology of it. And I was like, eh, that doesn't seem to fit. It felt like it fit. Um, I love the scene where Earl steps in the prairie dog hole and freaks out. Because uh, I think that was a really good kind of jump scare moment where it probably got a lot of people thinking, oh my gosh, did he just get grabbed by a graboid? Uh, but no, he didn't. So I thought that was a nice little moment. Because it's hard to do jump scares well. Uh, it's such a badass moment when Val punches the grabber when they get in the truck bed, like one of the little grab, the, the little like mouth things, the grabber portions comes out and he just like punches it. And it's just, a, I, I didn't see it coming and it was just kind of a funny slash badass moment. Um, I love it how all the townsfolk expect Rhonda ha to have all the answers. Oh, we already talked about that as being the scientist. 
Uh, the Graboid fast-moving POV shots actually work really well. They're very, very effective. Uh, it gives you an idea of how fast these things are moving as a person's running away. So those are well done. They add to the film quite a bit. Once the Graboids make it inside the general store, uh, this is kind of where there's no place to hide. And it actually, um, they're not going to be able to live anywhere. Because that's the thing. At first, when they're in the general store, they feel kind of safe. And then, you know, they have provisions and supplies and ways to defend themselves in there. And then once they get in through the bottom, it's like, crap. We are not going to be able to stay here and sustain ourselves. We have to go somewhere. So then they go to the roof. And even at that point, you know, the, the Graboids figure out how they can try and bring the buildings down. And they just keep getting smarter and smarter and limiting the options for these characters. And that's one of the great things about how this film progresses is the options continually become limited. So the amount of information they're needing to collect on the creature to figure out how to get around it and then how to kill it is crucial and they don't have a lot of time. And so like their ability to get something done like keeps getting smaller and smaller time frame wise. Um, once the Graboids make, oh, I already read that, sorry. Uh, when Bert and Heather are shooting the Graboid in their basement, wouldn't it retreat? This is kind of a bit of a plot hole for me. Um, I feel like when it comes through the wall and they're just shooting it, shooting it, shooting it, and they're grabbing all those guns, which the reveal of all the guns on the wall is, is a kind of a really funny moment because you're just like, wow, that's a lot. But they just keep using all these different guns and just going, going, going. That thing I would believe would retreat because there are many things in this film that indicate and that outright show that it learns, and it's actually kind of an intelligent creature. So the fact that it would just keep trying to go, 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 go at them while it's being injured um, and then eventually killed, it doesn't actually make sense that it would just keep trying to go. It would retreat, I think, with it, the intelligence level that they indicate of this thing. Just a little thing that I was like, eh, it doesn't really make sense. The space the townsfolk have to operate keeps shrinking gradually. Okay, yeah, I kind of already talked about that. With that happening, it just, you know, not only ups the tension, but it just makes things feel more hopeless. Everything's more high stakes at that point. Um, I like how Bert and Heather can just whip up pipe bombs, like, super, super fast. I love the fact that they're able to do that. It's, uh, it's a really funny, funny thing, um but it also doesn't really make sense because they make a lot of pipe bombs in a very small amount of time. And, you know, I guess people would say, like, this guy's kind of like a prepper. They're just those type of people. But they wouldn't need more time, I, I would think. Um, I also like the ongoing joke that nobody likes Melvin. Everybody hates that guy. And what's even better is when eventually there's, like, this moment of trust with Melvin where he they, they're trying to get him out of that like truck bed thing and he's like i'm not getting out there and then bert hands him the handgun and he's just like oh, okay awesome and then he realizes when he tries to shoot with it there are no bullets in it because guess what no one trusts melvin because <laughs> right before that he had said i wouldn't give you a gun if it was world war three which is a good joke which you know there are a lot of verbal jokes in this movie and they work for the most part because like i was saying the dialogue's well written um I do think that, as Bert points out, he and Heather would have been better off at their house. At the point where they end up on the rocks, uh, Bert says, you know, we would have been better off at our home. I don't know why we followed you guys. I think he's right, because they had a lot of a lot of stuff there. Uh, they seem to be able to really handle things well. So I do question, like, why did they go along with them? They had more stuff. They were more, they were handling it. So, yeah. They were right. They were totally right in that. They would have been better off not going with them. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the concept of pipe bomb fishing for the Graboids is a fun and interesting one, and I think it works really well in this film. And it's actually very hilarious when they actually get one, it explodes, and then all the viscera comes just, like, raining down on them. It's a gross and funny moment, and uh, I enjoy that quite a bit. If you notice, there's an ongoing issue of all Val and Earl's plans being trash, but there's finally the good one when Val leads the last Graboid to its death. I already kind of talked about that, but yeah. Um, so some kind of like things to wrap up this. Uh, the dialogue is very well written. Like I said, I cannot stress that enough. The dialogue is great. There's so many movies out there where the dialogue is trash. It's not done well at all, or it's meh, really good dialogue in this. I love it. 
Um, it's a well done PG 13 film, which to be honest for a horror film to be good and be PG 13, that's tough. It doesn't happen that often. And this is one of those ones, like I was talking about where you don't necessarily necessarily need to show all the gore or all the viscera or anything, or when you do, it's the graboids and it's orange. So, you know, you're not going to get hit hard by the MPAA for that. So they were smart about the way they made this. So I'm good with it being PG-13, whatever. Um, you could get away with not showing a bunch of gore since the carnage happens underground. I already talked about that. And then I guess I just wanted to close this kind of with a question. Now, it might be a little bit of a stretch to some people, but I would be interested in hearing what people have to say about it in the comments. Do you get to this movie without the success of the movie Jaws? Now, this is a little bit in my mind because um, the same day I watched Tremors, I watched the original Piranha, and that obviously was a ripoff of Jaws. But then as I'm watching Tremors and I'm on, like, Land Shark, the Graboids are basically modeled after sharks. Is this somehow tied to the success of Jaws? And if you didn't have Jaws, and Jaws was, or Jaws just wasn't a success like that, would we have ended up getting the Tremors? And I feel like, yeah, maybe, but maybe not. I don't know. So I think that's kind of worth debating in a sense. So put some comments down there, not only about that, but just, you know, about Tremors in general. I'd love to talk about that, um, especially if you have dissenting opinions. I always like to hear dissenting opinions because it brings up things I may not have thought about, which I'm always down to hear. But um, so a star rating on this out of five stars with half stars in play. I'm going to give this a solid four stars. I think this is a four star film. It's quite good. It's not perfect. It's not the best thing ever, but it's good. And I'm excited to move on to Tremors 2 Aftershocks. I think it's Aftershocks or Aftershock. One of those. Anyway, Aftershocks. Um, yeah, I'm excited to move on to it. And maybe I'll go all the way. Maybe I'll do all the Tremors reviews. And would you want that? Put some comments. But anyway, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe. Literally takes you a second. It is so painless. But it means a lot for my channel. And it's a great way to keep me going. To just say, hey, I support what you're doing. If you've already subscribed, though, go ahead and hit that thumbs up to let me know that you're still watching. I would appreciate that. Uh, and the other thing is, if you are going to subscribe and you want to know when I'm putting up videos or when I'm doing my live streams, make sure you hit the notification bell and you will get notified when I'm, especially when I'm doing the live stream. So, uh, but yeah, anyway, thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.